All right, thank, thanks for coming. Uh, this is It's a Mob. So first off, I'm Colin. I'm an engineer at Engineer Better. I do a lot of different things. Um, most of my time is spent helping clients deploy, update, and manage Cloud Foundry, usually using tools like Concourse. And I'm Kai Cooper. Mike. Yep, sorry. I'm Kai Cooper. I manage the Cloud Platform Operations um, function for Fiserv, and I'm working on the Finca platform. Uh, but generally, I help people solve problems. So conventionally, project work or any sort of work streams, um, the, the problem you've got is you've got um, people from the teams and who go off to do this project work or work stream, and you find it really difficult to knowledge share. And what you find is that it gets really tough with tight deadlines, and it gets even tougher with a heavy BAU stack. So what we needed, we needed to gain a shared, shared knowledge and deliver value. And it's all about how we've set up to achieve that, and, we've, and obviously we've approached engineer better to do so. Um, so we're going to discuss the merits of mobbing in the workplace. So to kick it off, uh, can I see a show of hands? Who has heard of mobbing? All right, and keep your hand up if you have actually mobbed. All right. So it's quite a few people, but in case anyone's unfamiliar, mobbing is basically a team structure around extreme programming. If you're not familiar with extreme programming, it's a paradigm revolves around the idea that there should be frequent releases and short development life cycles. Um, you often hear it in the same sentence as pairing, and basically mobbing is pairing with more people. So if you want to mob, you're going to need to collect your mob of conspirators. Uh, mob is generally minimum three, maximum five. More than five, it's hard to manage. Less than three, it's not a mob. You're a pair or a solo or there's just no one there. Um, you're also going to need one computer, one keyboard, one mouse, and the biggest screen that you can find. And position your mob in front of the screen. Um, and then you have everything that you need material-wise, but it's no fun if there's no rules. So there's some rules that help you get the most out of your mobbing experience. So the mob rules. Um, only one driver. There's only ever one person at the keyboard. Um, Everyone else acts as a navigator. And everything must be discussed. So every idea or anything you want to bring up has to be discussed amongst the team. So by extension, there's no typing unless the team agrees on what should be typed. So the driver still participates in the discussion. But even if the driver is the subject matter expert, they can't plow ahead. Everything needs to be discussed. Rotate every 10 minutes. So even if you're in the middle of a line of code, or in the middle of a thought, or you really know what's going to come next, when the time's up, the time's up. Be strict about that. Uh, sometimes with bigger mobs, dropping it down to eight minutes works well so that you're reducing the time between driving sessions. Otherwise, you lose interest if you haven't typed in an hour. Um, but don't go above 10. Don't go below eight. Don't forget to take breaks. Anyone that draining it is to pair. Uh, if you're soloing, your mind can drift. You can look out the window. You can check Facebook and the other tab. If you're pairing, you constantly have someone else bouncing ideas off of you mutually. Uh, mobbing's even more intensive because it's a continuous brainstorming kind of group think discovery session. And as soon as one person isn't engaged, the mob becomes less effective. And leave your phone alone. So. Notice I said one computer. Put your laptop away. Don't look at your email. Don't look at your messages. If you're in an environment where that's not practical and you need to respond to things, try to factor it into the breaks or schedule a specific time into your day. Don't interrupt the, uh, the mobbing session because, again, as soon as one person is disengaged, it starts to fall apart. So what's the outcome of this mobbing thing? What do we want to get out of it? Well, because everything is the result of a uh, conversation amongst the mob, and everything that's typed comes from group consensus, you really want to leverage on that group discussion. So in mobbing, code review happens implicitly. If you have five people in your mob, then, and everything that's been typed is the result of a group consensus, that means everything that you typed by the end of the day has been reviewed by five sets of eyes. 
Also, everyone's working together, so everyone's involved in every step from thinking about how to solve the problem through to execution. So in the end, everyone in the mob knows how the solution was achieved so they could reach it again. So now you know how to mob, and you know the desired outcome, but why would you want to mob? What kind of problems does it help you approach? Well, mobbing helps boost confidence on familiar tasks. Doing builds confidence, and it helps remove barriers. And also, it helps remove barriers within a team. So if you're discussing everything and kind of bringing up ideas and deciding what the best approach is, it leads you to a culture where it's OK to be wrong. It's OK to request something and say, I think we should go this way. And someone else in the group says, maybe that's not the best idea. And you have healthy discussion around it, brings the team together. For unfamiliar tasks, you've got tasks that are unfamiliar to the whole team. So suppose your team just discovered Cloud Foundry, and no one on the platform team knows anything about it, but you want to stand up a POC. Well, everyone on the team could get together and have a group brainstorming and discovery session and work towards the end goal. And then, in the conclusion, everyone kind of knows the steps that went into it and where you went to find resources on it and it makes everyone familiar. In the case where you have subject matter experts and it's unfamiliar only to some people, then it leads to really good teaching opportunities. I've personally found when delivering training, like the Kubernetes course that we delivered at the beginning of this summit, the best way to really understand something is to teach it. And by extension, even if you do understand it, the questions you get from people who are learning for the first time help you realize there's aspects of it that you may not have realized at the outset. So everyone learns, and it's two-way teaching for everyone. Also helps you, helps you avoid getting stuck down tangents. So I know when I'm soloing on things, I often get tunnel vision on what I think the answer is. And maybe that is an answer, but maybe there's an easier answer I missed at the start. And maybe I lost track of the big picture, and I'm solving a problem that isn't a problem. Um, by bouncing ideas off of each other and requiring group consensus to proceed, it helps you avoid those scenarios. Finally, avoiding single points of failure. You often hear this phrased as the bus factor. So if you think about your team at work, what would happen if one person at random is hit by a bus after work or takes leave or leaves the company? What if it's the one person that knows how to configure that thing on the platform or it's the only person that knows the F5 config, and now you have a deadline looming, they're nowhere to be found, how difficult is that? If you approach to new problems with a mob, everyone knows the, they have the shared knowledge and the shared context going forward. When I was working with Kai at Fiserv on this, I came to think about mob programming like mesh learning. So the idea that each person in the group is learning from everyone else, and what each person is learning might be different from each other person, but everyone comes out with more knowledge than they went in with. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Kai to talk about how they use mobbing at Fiserv. Thank you. So where do we fit in? So at the time, around about, I think it was about eight months ago, um, the Finca platform had multiple open source CF foundations, uh, and these were created independently of one another, and they were pretty hard to update. They had their own update cycles, um, and there was no formal testing between environments, and therefore it's pretty difficult to maintain and keep in line with the risk cadence of CF deployment. Um, and we also had a manual, uh, manual build, pack, build stack release process, uh, and this highlighted a, this, a need to move to a more focused delivery mechanism, something which would improve stability, but also deployment confidence. The main thing is that we needed was an easier, a system, systems that are easier to maintain after day one. So, so we can achieve what we, what we needed, we need to become familiar with multiple complex tools at the same time. Things like Concourse, Bosch, BBL, Terraform, Vault and Credo, but we needed a good knowledge base on Concourse and Bosch. And we needed a way to do it. So we had lots of experts in different areas, um, but we needed them to be experts in all the things. And people tend to learn differently and at different paces. They encounter different problems, and they also have different personalities. 
So therefore, we thought the mobbing seemed a, a, a good solution to help achieve consistency within the team. So to support our goal of automated Cloud Foundry pipelines and automated build, build tools pipelines, um, we, we had to learn Cogs and Bosch, um, so we approached Engineer Better. And they came on site to deliver a week's training course to help us get a good grounding of what we needed. Once we had that good grounding, um, things you know, felt a little bit better, but you know, people learn at different paces, and they learn differently, and there's so many factors which can affect this. The trouble was, we didn't feel all that confident on how we'd make a start. It's, it's a new thing. We had to completely change the way we do things. So again, we approached the engineer better, and we said, hey, come and help us out a bit again. Um, and we asked them to help us make a start um, on our work streams, and they thought it would be a great opportunity to introduce mobbing to us. Um, and and, and ex except, especially that, that we'd be able to you know, work on the things we needed and work on the things we wanted. So, mobbing with engineer better, brought in, as, as Colin mentioned earlier, we had, there's, there's this thing around extreme programming, we had frequent refinement sessions, um, which obviously depended on the tasks, but we also had frequent prioritizations of tasks, this de depended on the refinement sessions. And basically, we had um, a very intense two week, nine to five, mobbing every day. Um, I'd say it wasn't sustainable every day, but I think it was definitely, um, it's definitely worthwhile, it's a very good grounding um, of mobbing, um, but difficult to fit in with BAU. Um, once we finished the mobbing training, um, we had to determine how we'd best fit this in to everyday operations. Um, and this matured over a couple of weeks. It's, it definitely wasn't um, plain sailing for us to work it into everyday work workings within the team, um, but by, by like using specific slots and sessions uh, and also op you know, using tools that we use like a uh, our notification channels in work. Uh, we were able to create like reminders and, and, and put sessions in place for different people and different teams, and different work streams, where they can go off and, and, and work as a group. The main point is, mobbing requires 100% attention. You have to be upfront about this commitment. You have to, it's really important. Um, and and if, it's, if, it, if you're not clear about when you want to break and what the objective is for each mobbing session is going to severely affect the output of the group. We also found that time boxing our mobbing sessions allowed us to allocate time to other responsibilities and this meant that we weren't neglecting anything else. We could work it into our working week, working day, whatever we felt, but we had to be strict about it. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, you can't be relaxed about the time that you spend allocating to things. It becomes inefficient. The other point um, is, how do you mob with a distributed team? This is really tough. Um, you know, especially when it's not balanced. You end up with people within different environments. Um, and when we were training, this wasn't so much of an issue because luckily our remote engineers made their way down to the office so that we were all together. We were all in that same level um, field where we can talk to one another and see each other's body language. It was, it was, it was really good. But then once the training completed, it was almost like, you know, it was, became difficult. And it was, but it wasn't difficult for, for the people who were the majority in the room. It was difficult for the people who were minority on, on the remote end, on the call. Um, so one thing we learned that, to counter that, the best thing to do was to reduce the minorities and be the majority. So get everyone on the call with you. Get everyone on Skype, get everyone on Hangouts. Whatever tool you use to have to have a remote session and actually use that as your mobbing platform. Also influencing other teams. Now this, this was quite interesting because we, we tend to do a lot of cross-functional work streams in FISA, which is, which is really useful because, again, knowledge sharing. Um, but by doing so, by applying mobbing to cross-functional teams, what you end up with is that the ability to influence the teams that the engineers belong to, it goes back, it spreads, it becomes something which is more common within the workplace rather than, oh, they're just, they're moving over there. I don't know anything about that. People talk about it. So just to go over 
A few points that we found prevalent within, within FISA, when we were modern FISA, consistency is key. So all participants, consistency ensures that all people can focus on the task at hand and what's important. And it's really, really imperative to take breaks. It's very strenuous. It's, you, you're engaging for long periods of time. And when you're about to mob, determining the, at the right at the beginning the objectives and when you're breaking and what the outcome needs to be, it helps enable the mob to be a mob. Mobbing etiquette. So this comes down to, so you've, so you've up front, you've, you've defined everything you want to achieve and every, uh, sort of the rules of the mob. What you then need to do is stick to them. So I saw, we saw a few times, I guess, in our experience of, of some of the sessions we had, um, people would return from breaks late. Um, and during the modern session, they pull their phone out and they start replying. They're not engaging. That means that you're wasting that effort. You're wasting that, that, that consensus of having a debate, having a, a discussion about something. Somebody that could have a really valid point is not engaging. Please, please make yourself present. Um, conference rigor. So this comes back to remoting again. So if you are on a remote call, if, you, if people have to be in the same environment where you have distributed teams, make sure that that you, you understand and you, you have patience when you're talking with one another on these remote calls. Sometimes it can be easy for people to talk over one another. Um, take, take your time, allow people to be heard, and it, it gives an, you need to, basically you need to create an environment where all mob participants, are, you know, they're able to contribute freely. Um, and this is 100% necessary to ensure 100% contribution. Beware of leaders. This is an interesting one. Um, so, I won't lie, we've got a book on the bookshelf that my wife ordered, um, Black Box Thinking. And it's all about beware, be, beware of leaders. Um, and, and the actual example came out, I think, from uh, medicine. So, predominantly that if a leader is standing up and talking and is very strong about their opinion, you're less likely to either counter it or, or ask, ask more about it or question it. Ask questions. You need to ask questions. It's really, really important. If you don't understand or agree, it's, it's, it's a place where you need to ask about it. And remember, as Colin stated, that the desired outcome mobbing is that the decisions are made by group consensus. Remote teams. I, I got this up a few times, remote teams, but for any type of task where the problem is it's not known, it's, it's, a, it's a knowledge sharing. Ex oh, it's a, it's, I'm sorry, I've gone on the wrong point. R routine of your tasks, as Colin mentioned, sorry, it's um, if, if you're working on something new, mobbing fits in really well. And if it isn't, if it's, if it's just a repetitive task and you need to upskill people on that task, then it's probably worth considering pairing instead. So remote teams. Um, it, is, it is possible to mob effectively remote teams. Um, obviously, when you're not in a room with one another, you miss a lot of human context, um, there might be a camera in the room, but it's not easy to see body language and it's not the same, you don't get the same vibes, so be patient. Um, there are tools out there like instant messaging or meeting software or actually live code editing where you can both contribute to the same piece of code at, the same, uh, you know, at different times, so if you are swapping between mob participants in the group, you, know, you don't have to check in your code and push it and then Pull that, pull that down, you, you can actually work on the same piece of code and, and swap pretty instantly. Um, but it is it's more prevalent that the mobbing rules are adhered to. Unclear requirements. This one is a tough one. So if you don't have clear requirements when you're about to mob on something, then trying to achieve a consensus on it, it's, it's a waste of time. You're always going to be debating about something that you're unsure of. Um, and this is sometimes demoralizing. Always time box the initial refinement or objective discussion. If you don't achieve what you need to get out of from that initial discussion, take it offline. This will help focus in on the outcome of the mob. Um, so I guess I talked about what we needed up front, and I talked about the things we changed. Um, but at the, end of all, at the end of most of our mobbing sessions, our work streams, by participating in mobbing, we succeeded to get an autonomous CF release pipeline. Uh, and this updates all CF foundations that we have. I think we have about seven at the moment. Um, and they're all autonomous, all changes roll through them. Different tests between each environment. 
uh, and that was all built using Bosch as well. Um, and we also have a, an autonomous build tools reads pipeline, also built using Bosch, and staged environments, all testing between each environment. Um, and, and all pipelines assure that any new version is tested prior to production deployment. But the, the best thing about the outcome of both work streams is that all of the team is familiar with both platforms and they can operate them in, as individuals. So we've also found that we've, since we've injected mobbing into, into our work streams in, in, in Fiserv, that there are many ways we've benefited. And I think, I think it's definitely applies itself really well to operational issues. Um, it allows all members of the mob to become familiar with how to triage production issues and then subsequently in increases their confidence when they're problem solving. And I found that mobbing certainly fits well within our organization. So I'll now hand you back to Colin to look at how they mob an engineer better. Thanks, Guy. So mobbing an engineer better, it's a lot less structured than is at Fiserv, but that's because as a consultancy, everything we do is a bit less structured. Um, the main way we implement mobbing engineer better is as a consultancy service like we did at Fiserv. So at engineer better, we love teaching clients about how to leverage technology and process to make the most of their platforms. But what we love even more is actually delivering value while we do that. So I found instructor led training where you have one instructor, many students working through some preconceived questions in a preconceived set amount of time. The outcome is the students, ho hopefully, um, have learned valuable skills, but then it's up to them to bring that back into their teams, into their normal workflows, and apply it to the stories that they're working on. With mobbing, we found you can have one consultant from Engineer Better and many clients all learning from each other while delivering value because what you're mobbing on is a story from the team's backlog that delivers value to their stakeholders. Um, on the other hand, we have some open source projects that we do within Engineer Better, the primary one being Concourse Up, a CLI tool for deploying Concourse, handles all the Bosch stuff for you, currently only on AWS, but we're working on it. Um, within Engineer Better, we pair 90 plus percent of the time, but being a consultancy, sometimes, well, the bench team rotates a lot, sometimes people go off on billable work, sometimes we have an odd number of people on the bench, and Depending on the problem, sometimes a pair and a solo works well, sometimes a mob works really well, and sometimes a pair gets stuck down some tangent and forming a mob to look at that problem drags them out of it. Um, so we've spoken a lot about benefits of mobbing and why you would want to, but why is there resistance when we propose it to clients? It's not always an enthusiastic response. And, um, Quite often it's something like this, and if you've ever tried implementing pairing at a kind of a big kind of old school enterprise, you've probably heard something similar to this of, well, how could multiple people working on one problem possibly be more efficient than if they just all worked on stuff by themselves? And it, to be fair, it depends on the problem, but for, for the most part, I've actually found that five people working on one problem, if you're doing it right, is actually faster than if they worked on it separately. But that's not really the point. The point with mobbing is that everything is the result of group consensus. So you've brainstormed the solution with the whole group. Generally, this catches more edge cases than you would with a smaller group or a solo person working on it. And this reduces problems down the line when there's things you haven't tested for, and it causes errors that are harder to back out of. Um, and you also gain insight into the problem with lots of knowledge sharing. So the really big takeaway from mobbing that I've seen is with five people working on one problem, no matter how long it takes you to solve the problem, the result is you have a solution that is known and understood by five people. If you have five people working on five problems independently, whenever they finish their solutions, you now have five solutions, each one known by one person. Um, so as a recap, I've assembled some general principles we found useful with mobbing. Um, some are recaps of earlier points. Some are tips on how to implement some of them. So the driver can't do anything without permission. Don't, don't let the driver go off and 
be a leader and be a hero and type stuff. Um, make sure everything's the result of group consensus. And use a timer. Be really strict with your timing. Actually set a stopwatch. When the alarm goes off, it hands off. Time to swap around. Limit the team size. Five really is a hard maximum. Um, as soon as there's more than five, it gets annoying for the driver because you're having too many people offering suggestions. And it's really hard to find the right balance between um, having everyone cycle enough as driver that they're not sitting, not typing for too long, while also having the driver have enough time to actually type something in between all the discussion. Avoid distractions. I mentioned before, leaving your phone alone. But also avoid side conversations. Even if the side conversation is related to whatever the mob is discussing, it's still not the whole mob coming to the consensus on something. And as soon as one person is disengaged, feels like their voice isn't heard, it starts to become ineffective. And because all of this is really draining, make sure you take frequent breaks. But possibly more important, before you leave for the break, decide when to come back so that you don't all come back and find that there's that straggler that's disappeared. And then you have to decide what you want to do about that. Um, so with that in mind, why don't you try it out for yourself and your team? Uh, thanks for listening to us and open to questions. <laughs> So maybe you explained this, but I, I didn't quite catch it. Like what percentage of your, t it sounds like you, you're not mobbing all the time. You kind of mentioned you, you kind of have to go into another mode at other times. So what percentage, yeah, yep. Kai, uh, so what percentage are you mobbing, I it, guess? It generally depends on the type of work that we need to do. So it, obviously that if we've got issues that we have to fix up front, um, and it's stuff that's, that's down right now, and we feel it's beneficial to mob on, on a, an triage, a, a real issue, that we'll, we'll mob at that time, um, and on project work. But there'll be a lot of, you know, there'll be a lot of things that we do every day that are very similar to, to, to the, the, the last week or the week before, so we'll, we'll consider pairing, or we'll have individuals do it. Generally, it's around about 50-50. Um, and, it, you know, you've got to balance it around people on leave as well, and, and things like that. So... I'd say around 50-50 is, is a good mix. Is it the same mob like day after day? Ah, right, so that's, that's a good Do new one. mobs like spawn? Like <laughs> when it's a new, a different problem or Again, like? Again, workshop dependent, but one thing we had um, during the, the sort of times that we were trying to work out the balance is that I, I found that if you were the same mob doing things, then you're not mob knowledge sharing, are you? So you, you kind of build up knowledge in this one like bit of project work you're doing. So I pick out people and put them into different mobs and replace people every sort of every maybe sprint or a couple of weeks. And that would help then drive the the need to learn for that new person injected into the mob and they were doing something new, something interesting, and then do it with other people as well, you know, randomly sometimes. But it keeps things interesting and also keeps different personalities thinking of the um, answers or, or thinking of solutions to different problems. Um, some people have strong opinions about design and how to implement things. Like, how does like moderation look like in a mobbing? Like, if like someone is trying to take too much time or never really like give other chance to talk. Like, is there anyone who owns that, or is, how does it work? Um, when we did it at Pfizer. Uh, it was myself and Dan Jones in the front here. And we sort of acted as moderators for the group to get it started. Um, so I actually skipped being a driver on most of the rotations and would just sit there and be strict with the time and make sure everyone swapped. But uh, generally, you can self-organize. It would be a similar to uh, when you're pairing, like how you decide when it's time for someone to drive and Otherwise, so as long as someone keeps track of the time and everyone knows to be strict about it, I, I can see how it would work. I assume that's yeah. probably what's... Yeah. Right. Um, what, what does the mob do during time-consuming operations? Like, say you're doing a Bosch deploy that's going to take six minutes. What, what does everyone do? Do they leave and play on their phones and then come back? Or how, how do you deal with that? 
So I'd say if there are times that, that things like that occur, then you often have um, slots where you can review pull requests. You know, there are pull requests out there. You can review, review them as a mob. There are, there are things that you can do and discuss as a group, and not just wait for things to, to push through pipelines and things like that. So, you know, be creative. You know, look at things. Um, break down, it, refine. Go back to, your, go back to your, your board and refine some tasks while you're waiting for the result of what you, what, what you did six minutes ago. Um, when we have a group of very different characters, some are very dominant and they speak 80% of the time, others are very silent and just are there for the consensus and say yes or no. Um, is there a methodology to make them somewhat equally? I mean, it, well, it depends on the team. It's kind of up to the team to foster the right kind of uh, team behavior, I guess, but you want to make sure everyone feels safe to raise their opinions. And it, it's similar to when people first start pairing and you feel like, I certainly did, you feel like you don't want to slow down the pair and you don't really understand, you're afraid to make mistakes, and it's up to the more experienced people to say, like, it, it's okay, we'll slow down, we'll make sure. And if there's really dominant people, it's really good if they can notice when people are being really silent and maybe try to call on them or pull them into the conversation. Um, so it's, it's kind of up to the team to self-organize. Uh, that's the answer. Then from question for me, um, do you propose uh, adjustments to the working environment for mobbing? So bigger screens or whiteboard, smart board maybe, so you can um, collaborate on, on the working the driver does on the smart board. Um, is that helpful? Would you uh, propose that? Or so you it, say it's more like a, the same workstation you have for pair programming? So I guess it's, it depends on how the team's set up. If everyone is co-located, it's really easy. You get the biggest screen you can get or a projector. You sit everyone down at the desk with the one keyboard and you work on it and you work that way. As soon as you have remote people, it becomes a little harder. And I, I think the answer is just try different things and see what works. The end goal is to have really good group discussions and collaborate with each other and uh, one driver at a time. And as long as you fall within those constraints, how you implement it, it's use whatever technology you can use at your company. Some are much more constrained than others. And also, like if you try something and it's not working, maybe try something else the next time you mob. Meeting rooms. Yeah. Yeah. As long as the, the driver doesn't have to crane their neck to look sideways on screen. Little... <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> microphones. Um, talking of people that like to talk too much in a group. Um, yeah, meeting rooms tend to be good for uh, mobbing sessions when co-located uh, because they normally have a big screen in, enough room to fit people in comfortably. The only issue there is are the desks or the tables set up in a way that the driver doesn't have to crane their neck uh, whilst they're typing. I think, I think an important point to, to remember, though, is um, sorry. I think an important point to remember is that in this day and age, a lot of companies want to push remote working. So if you become more comfortable with remote working and working with people that are distributed, then it's probably better for you and better for your company. So I probably try and push that if you can. Any more questions? Then thank you. Very much. Thank you.